We're taking a deep dive into the New York Giants struggles of 2023 with Brad Spielberger, a pro football focus that's coming your way next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode of the Locked on Giants podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Chena. I'm your host. And on today's program, we're going to talk about this miserable season that the New York Giants are having, just absolutely miserable from top to bottom. And joining me to break it all down is Brad Spielberger. He is an analyst over at Pro Football Focus. So he was very kind to to accommodate the scheduling today with all the conference calls and everything like that. But we're finally doing this, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Brad to the program. Brad, how are you, my friend? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I uh, actually went to the training Giants training camp. Uh, I'm sure you were there earlier this offseason. I know the, the scheduling is crazy and, and different, you know, interviews, different times moved around. So, you know, I totally get it. Well, I appreciate you and uh, the work that you do. And Brad, you know, I want to start off with a kind of a financial question here, because I know you also dabble in the salary cap, which, of course, is a, a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, the New York Giants, don't have a whole lot of cap space, which means they're they're probably one of the biggest payrolls in the NFL. They're just not getting value in, uh, you know, obviously one win. Uh, they're just not getting value across the board. But when you look at this roster right now, where do you see them really bleeding the most as far as not getting the return on investment that they've made financially? It's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, the highest paid players on the team, left tackle Andrew Thomas, when healthy, is certainly a good player. And I, and I loved that five-year extension. I think it was actually a very team-friendly structure. Um, and, and, you know, Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams are playing good football. Dexter Lawrence is our second highest graded interior defender and continues to, you know, dominate games at times. Leonard Williams, yes, got a very player-friendly contract, short-term, big money, all those things, had a lot of leverage going into that second franchise tag, but he hasn't really been a problem either. I mean, I guess one could be a Dory Jackson, kind of a tough role for him this year, played in the slot, played out wide, doing a lot of different things, um, but certainly not grading overly well for us this season. So it's interesting. It's more, I think, an issue of just a lot of recent draft picks and, and young players that maybe were expected to take on larger roles at an earlier rate. You know, Trey Hawkins and Deontay Banks and some of the, the offensive linemen, Evan Neal. Certainly not a good value um, at right tackle with a top 10 pick. But, but yeah, it's not, I wouldn't even blame – I mean, of course, Daniel Jones will get brought up, and I'm sure we'll get into him more. But I'm not even sure that's the main issue. I really think it's just the last couple draft classes for them, Kevon Thibodeau as well, hasn't been, hasn't been stellar. Like, that's kind of been the bigger issue. Yeah, still – the jury's still out on them, and you really can't fully judge a draft class until they've been around for three years. But I do want to ask you about Daniel Jones because I actually was was – Going to have that as my next question. Daniel got paid four years, 160 million. I think that averages out to about 40 million, but it's really not a true 40 million because, you know, the last two years they could easily get out of it. And that kind of skews the numbers a little bit. When you look at the situation the Giants were in, I mean, they were drafting, I want to say, was it 26 this year? I forget if it was 25th or 26th. You know, there was the chances of them getting a franchise quarterback to fall down just wasn't going to happen. I mean, were the Giants pretty much stuck, do you think, with Daniel Jones? And then when you look at the value that of his contract, is it really that bad compared to the rest of the quarterbacks in the league? Like you said, really, it's a two-year, $82 million deal, and then we'll see. Um, my big sticking point is I reject the notion that they were backed into a corner because they had to franchise tag Saquon Barkley. And, I mean, you see the contract that comes out well, yesterday for Jonathan Taylor, you know, three years, $42 million. 
I, I'm confident Saquon Barkley would have taken less than that. Maybe, you know, three years at 12 and a half million per year, 13 million per year in that range. And without getting into a larger conversation about running back value and how you pay those guys and the attrition at the position, obviously Barkley dealing with an injury already with the high ankle sprain, like ignoring all of that, in my opinion, to pay a quarterback who frankly had not proved enough to me just so you can franchise tag a running back is just not good process. And it doesn't, you know, I probably would have rather given Saquon Barkley a, a three-year deal in the Nick Chubb, you know, Jonathan Taylor range. The franchise tag originally was designed for Daniel Jones. Like there has not been a more clear picture, perfect example of why the franchise tag exists than a guy playing good football, finally getting a good offensive play caller, overcoming a bad offensive line and, and, and you know, mediocre playmakers that might even be kind of generous, like, you know, but still going to the playoffs, playing very well against Minnesota in that playoff game. But, you know, you look at the data for us, you know, 6.5 yards per attempt, his, his grade was mediocre, his, he had like five big time throws, which is a subjective stat, but nevertheless, like he was operating well in, in an offense. He is a good athlete, all those things. I, I just don't think an extension was the appropriate move at that time. Sticking with Jones for a moment, one of the criticisms, well, actually, there's a couple of criticisms of him. Number one, he can't seem to win from the pocket. And number two, he's more of a one read quarterback. If his first read is gone, that's it. Forget it. Do you see that in your analysis of him? I do think the second part certainly pops up. I think he can win in the pocket. I don't think he's just kind of this mobile guy that has to throw on the move. Like he can stand in there, he can deliver good balls, he's a good thrower of the football. But the, the concerns about him going through his progressions, yeah, I, I think it does pop up a lot. I mean, I mean the uh, the pick six against Seattle, he's staring down the receiver the entire time and throws it right to Devin Witherspoon. Like there are other plays on tape where you just notice that he's not going through his reads and he's kind of zeroed in. And, and again, to Brian Dable last year, there are coaches that can scheme that player open <laughs> and create a very functional and positive offense. I'm not saying it was all Brian Dable and zero Daniel Jones. Like I said, I think his circumstances around him were not great. But but I do think that is true to, to a degree. Um, and obviously this year when your pass blocking is, is frankly untenable, unplayable, it, you know, it, it makes it even tougher. You look at, you know, and, and, and I know we're still kind of quote unquote early in the season, but – I would be really surprised at this point if come next year, Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley are both on this team. I, I think they move on from Saquon. That being said, I mean, how big of a impact do you think would be to remove Saquon from this team? I mean, do, do you see Daniel Jones' success kind of tied in with Saquon and vice versa? Or, I mean, if you had to prioritize, which way would you go? So I do. And I think this is, again, going to the, the whole conversation about running back value. For me, if a guy can pass protect and can catch, catch passes out of the backfield, it puts him in a different category. Like, would I pay a guy who's just an early down bruiser runner? You know, in the Brandon Jacobs days, sure. In today's NFL, probably not. But obviously, Barkley, I mean, the touchdown catch against Arizona was a, you know, like a game changing play. He makes those plays all the time. He makes players miss in space. He can stand in and pass protect at a pretty good rate. He was top five for us among running backs and pass block grade last year. Like those elements make him very valuable. But I, I, I tend to agree with you. I'm not sure they are going to give him a deal. I don't think they really played ball all that much this past offseason. And, you know, I'm not sure why that would change to, to an extreme degree. So, you kind of have to stick with Daniel Jones, at least for 2024. Um, and, and it is tied together. It is. I'm not, it's not, I'm not going to make the excuse of like, oh, like losing Saquon Barkley means Daniel Jones has this big excuse for him. They got to get better in a lot of other areas. I think Wandale Robinson's continued emergence is a huge positive. Jalen Hyatt getting more of him involved. Like, oh, there, there's a lot of positive to come, um, but it certainly will not help. Speaking of the receivers, the Giants made a conscious effort to, to beef up the speed. They added Paris Campbell in free agency. They brought back um, Sterling Shepard. They brought back Darius Slayton. They drafted Jalen Hyatt. Um, do they just have too many receivers? Because it just seems like you look at the game plan every week with this team, and they're trying to get it to. And, and I didn't even mention Darren Waller, who you know was a tight end, but you know he's still part of the receiving group there. And it just seems like. There's no guy there. There's no, you know, it factor, if you will. Do you think that was a mistake in retrospect? Because last year they seemed to do so much more with so little less, you know? 
I do think Waller was supposed to be that guy. Like you said, he is a tight end, but he's basically a, you know, a big slot receiver and, and can be that guy on third downs and money downs and obviously is coming off probably his best statistical output of the season. But my issue, more so than just too many guys, is they're – they're all similar style of player. Like they have eight guys that probably belong in the slot more so than out wide, including Jalen Hyatt, who I get they're trying to work him more out wide. When I came to training camp, like I mentioned, that was the day he had that beautiful bomb touchdown pass. And I think he did line up out wide on that snap, but he was an 80% plus guy in the slot in college. So was Wondell Robinson. So was Sterling Shepard. I mean, I'm sitting there and Cole Beasley was there that day. And I'm like, Cole Beasley's their 10th slot receiver on the roster. Like, I don't understand. So, that's the issue for me is the style of player they have is so redundant where they don't have that like contested catch possession guy, right? Like you do want speed, speed kills, speed is great. Go get a six foot four, 220 pound guy that can catch seven yard slant routes and, and let Daniel Jones get rid of the ball early in the shot clock. Like they don't, they don't have that. Right. They definitely don't have that. All right. Coming up next, I saved this unit for this next segment. We're going to talk about the offensive line with Brad Spielberger. He is with Pro Football Focus. Folks, we'll be right back. Hey, Giant fans, snap into NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets, guaranteed. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is super easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get started. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. You got me, Patricia Trena, your host, and I'm joined by Brad Spielberger. He is with Pro Football Focus. He dabbles a little bit in salary cap matters, and he is, of course, an analyst over there. So you've got the best of both worlds with Brad here on the program. And Brad, I wanted to see the offensive line to start off its own segment because I look at this Giants team and I am just absolutely flabbergasted at what I've seen from the offensive line. Now, Andrew Thomas is injured. I get that. He is their best offensive lineman. We can all, I think we can both agree on that. John Michael Schmitz, the rookie center, you could probably make a case that he has been their second best offensive lineman as far as consistency goes. Now, to me, I look at this offensive line and I say, they just took a big gamble here. They gambled that Evan Neal would be better. They gambled that Joshua Zudu and Marcus McKethan, both of whom missed chunks of last year with injuries, would come back in and, you know, snap to it. They gambled that Shane Lemieux would be better. Um, ben Bredesen would be better. You look at this collection of offensive linemen. Is it that these guys are just playing out of place? Is it the coaching? Is it the scheme? What has been the biggest issue outside of the injuries to Thomas and to now Schmitz? Yeah, I do think part of it is, you know, last year we saw them get the ball out much quicker um, and, and kind of scheme around an offensive line. Like, I think one of the storylines of the NFL this year is like San Francisco, Miami, Seattle, Arizona. Like, they don't have talented offensive linemen, but they are coaching around that. They're moving the pocket. They're getting the ball out in two and a half seconds or less a lot of the time. And again, is it one read stuff? Sure. But it's just focusing on we're trying to protect our offensive line because we know they're not the best players. You get them in a true pass set, they're probably going to lose a handful of reps. So I think some of that needs to needs to get back to what the Giants were doing last year. But also, yeah, I mean, Azudu playing left tackle is tough. It's a lot to ask of a, of a young player. Uh, I mean, Evan Neal, look, he's he a top 10 pick on a guy. You probably should think he's going to be the solution. You know, he did switch spots going from left side to right side is not an easy thing to do. I think we overlook that sometimes, just assume it's this seamless transition. And it's really not, although he did have some right tackle experience in college. But anyway, it, I mean, they've just been poor. I, I mean, across the board, their grades are all in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. They're all near the top of the NFL and pressure rate allowed. They're not really getting much of a push in the run game either. They're bottom 10 in yards before contact per rushing attempt, which is one of my favorite offensive line stats, kind of clearing the lanes for those running backs. So, I mean, even like a guy like a Mark Lewinsky, the veteran, like he's been he's been playable, but really not probably worth what they signed him for. I mean, yeah, you can protect them better. I think Daniel Jones also is holding on to the ball too long at times and probably creating his own sacks, but it's certainly the offensive line unit. I mean, right now they're playing like the worst offensive line in the NFL. All right. So then to your point about how they can maybe scheme around the offensive line, what are they doing differently this year 
that's creating all these problems that they weren't doing last year. You mentioned obviously getting the ball out of Daniel Jones's hands faster, but you know, do you see that, you know, just a function of the receivers not getting open, just the, the scheme in general? What, what do you think is at, at the core of that? So I think when you mentioned that emphasis on speed, I think there also was an emphasis on creating more explosives because it is hard to win having, you know, 12 play drives where you pick up seven, eight yards of pass play. Like they did it a lot last year. They got away with it a lot last year, but it is hard to do. And so you bring in a Jalen Hyatt, you know, you have a Wandale Robinson. Those guys can win vertically. But for me, I would want more bubble screens and quick outs and and just getting the ball out immediately and let those guys make players miss in space and use their speed after the catch. As far as like creating separation and all that, I, I do think maybe to a degree that, that defenses spent the offseason studying Brian Dable's offense and figuring out what he likes to do. You know, a lot of switch releases and bunch sets and stack formations and all these things that that create free releases for receivers and, and help them win. I think the reason why they dominated Minnesota twice on offense was because that team sat back in soft zone and lets you win underneath. I think teams are being more physical with them and, and pressing them at the line and, and not letting them get free releases and forcing them to win one-on-one -on -one matchups more often, I think, than we saw last year. And, 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 yeah, guys are not really getting open. Simple question, but yet it's not a simple question. Last year, the Giants were able to win with Daniel Jones. You know, there's the old win with him versus win in spite of him. That being said, do you think the Giants can win with Daniel Jones or was last year just a fluke? You know, win is relative. Like, I think they can be a playoff team again. I, I don't see him winning many playoff games again. I mean, they beat Minnesota. They, no, nothing to take away from that. I, I don't really think Minnesota was a great playoff team either, but they won 13 games. They had a home playoff game. Like, we're not going to, you know, take that away from what Daniel Jones did. But at the end of the day, like, not really. Like, I, I don't see them making a conference championship game or, or anything of that nature. I think you can get him much better surrounding circumstances. I still think his receiving an offensive line is near the bottom of the NFL. And you know, we talk about Brock Purdy every, every, you know, Sunday or Monday after he has an incredible game and not to diss him, but like you put Daniel Jones, in that Niners offense, he's probably pretty productive this year. He's probably doing a lot of good things, but that's obviously a pipe dream to replicate, you know, one of the best supporting casts in the entire NFL with maybe the best play caller of the last, I don't know, 20 years. So I think you can win regular season games with him. I'm not sure I view him as a guy that's going to, you know, win you games against other good quarterbacks in the playoffs, you know, because they didn't really do that last year either. So can Daniel Jones help himself? Can he help elevate the talent around him? And if so, what does he need to do in order to maybe help that offensive line to help get his receivers open? You know, what, what can he do? I think you could ask for more plays moving the pocket. I, I think he's an accurate passer to the intermediate level when he's rolling to his right or his left. Um, he sets a good platform. I think he has good fundamentals a lot of the time. Like his misses, I think, are more, you know, predicated on different things than his lack of fundamentals and, and, and you know, his his tools and ability. So that would be a more of a kind of a game plan change. But, of course, the quarterback has influence and can ask for certain things. But, yeah, I also think it's just getting the ball out quickly and, and maybe taking some of those easy hitters – Trusting Darren Waller to maybe win matchups early on, even if he is kind of covered, just put it in a spot where you think he can win. I know he's kind of had some contested catches that have not gone his way already this year, a couple tipped interceptions, things like that. But I think that will regress in a positive manner, and we'll see more and more better Waller, especially as he gets healthy. So that's got to be it, I think, is just getting the ball out quickly and trusting that your guys are going to make plays. Because right now, waiting for things to develop downfield – it's not really an option. And that's not Daniel Jones's fault, but it's not an option. Going back to the, um, the play calling for a moment, Mike Kafka last year was exclusively the play caller. This year, there's been some question as to whether or not Brian Dable has gotten involved. We see him with the play card. We see him hold the play card over his mouth. So that's got people's tongues wagging, if you will, that maybe he's a little bit more involved than in that. Given, you know, what we've seen, is that maybe too many cooks in the kitchen? Do you think at this point, you know, the Giants should just say, okay, Dable, you call the plays and, and Kafka, you're just going to consult or, or do you, you know, do you think it's just metal or not metal, but muddied up the whole picture? It's interesting because Dable obviously has experience on both sides of the football. So I think him being a CEO type head coach makes sense. Right. But, but from my perspective, I would say, 
and we haven't even gotten to the defense. But Wink Martindale can, can run a side of the football by himself. Like, I know they haven't been good this year, but he's an established, very good coach in the NFL. If you had, like, a young defensive coordinator or someone you didn't really feel as confident about, maybe it would make sense to have Dable kind of have his hands in both operations. It might be worth looking into to see him be more involved. I mean, you look in Buffalo – they were phenomenal when Dayball was the offensive coordinator. They've obviously still been good, but I think that offense was running smoother, uh, you know, two years ago than it was last year. And even, you know, some games have been great this year. Some games have been kind of clunky for them. So, I mean, at a certain point, you got to do something to change things up. I'm sure he's involved, you know, all the way through up until Sunday. And I do think Mike Kafka is a good young offensive coordinator, probably a future head coach in this league. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you got to try something new because whatever they're doing right now is, is obviously not working. No, it's not. All right. You mentioned the defense. We're going to talk about the defense coming up next. Hey, Giant fans, if you want to secure tickets to your favorite concert shows and sporting events without the stress, you need to check out Game Time, the fast and easy way to buy tickets right up until the day of the event. With amazing deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you're going to have. With Game Time, you not only get the lowest prices, you also get clear images of seat views within the venue, and you get event cancellation protection. And if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So go ahead and snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Terms apply. Again, that's code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. All right, everybody, welcome back to Locked On Giants. I'm your host, Patricia Chana, joined by Brad Spielberger, a pro football focus, and we're talking Giants. What else will we be talking on the Locked On Giants podcast? And Brad, I want to talk about the defensive side of the ball. I wanted to save that for its own segment as well. Um, the Giants have kind of picked up where they left off last year, not necessarily in a good way. And I'm, of course, referring to the run defense. You know, they they added um, Raheem Nunes Roches. They added Sean Robinson, who's been pretty good. Bobby Okereke, you know, inside linebacker, um, who was a tackling machine for the, uh, the Indianapolis Colts. But the run defense is, continues to get gashed. What's gone wrong with this unit i mean i i have my thoughts but i want to hear what your thoughts are i think it's just too easy right now to run off tackle to, to attack their edges i mean Kayvon thibodeau has like a 33 run defense grade for us as ezo jalari is probably even lower uh so that's the issue is as good as their interior is i think you can get to the edge against this team very well and then i love deontay banks as a tackle out of maryland but of course a, a first round or first Rookie player, granted a first round pick, but like, so, so I think those things are an issue. Besides Okereke, the linebacker core, I think, is still in need of reinforcements. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's just it's just too easy for me to get get to the edge against them. And today's NFL with so much outside zone and wide zone and and pre snap motion to attack those edges, you know, no one runs between the tackles anymore. So if they did, I think Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams would be causing problems. But teams are kind of just scheming around those two on the interior. You mentioned Leonard Williams. To me, he's been, I don't want to say invisible, but I haven't seen the impact that we that we're used to seeing from him. Is he starting to slow down in your opinion? Yeah, probably a little bit. Yeah. I think you see fewer of those splash plays. Obviously, you know, going into the extension had the big what, 10 and a half sacks, you know, a career high for him. Yeah, I mean, I think he is a good down to down player, but again, when you're paying twenty one million dollars a year, you want a guy that's like, you know, flipping the field and, and causing turnovers and, and and forcing offenses to you know double him or combo block him or or really account for his presence. And he's not in that caliber of player. He's a good but not great football player. Dexter Lawrence is a great football player. Leonard Williams is not in that category. So. Yeah, I mean, look, he's, you know, at the end of his extension, he's a bit older player at this point in his career, um, and, and I don't think he's a difference maker, you know, at this stage. What about the back end of the defense? There's been some debate whether Wink Martindale has what he needs in order to run his defense on the back end at, at any rate. Do you think he has everything he needs back there as far as, you know, being able to play man-to-man -man coverage a lot? Um, is he lacking because, you know, he's got some youth back there that's still cutting his teeth or what do you see from that group? 
No, I don't. And, and I'll say this. I, I really do think Joe Shane has done a lot of good, but I, I've been confused the entire offseason. I'm a broken record at this point. But, like, the, them neglecting – I would say edge rusher first. When you're the blitz happiest team in the NFL and you basically have two edge rushers on the roster. I know they traded for, you know, Boogie Basham right before the season began, bring him over from Buffalo. But, I mean, you, you have two guys that have dealt with injuries, you know, throughout their career, particularly Ojolari. You know you're going to blitz 50% of the time – and you basically have two edge rushers. It made no sense to me. And then, if you you know, and why that matters when you ask for the secondary is the way Wink Martindale gets away with that a lot of the time in having maybe not great outside corners that can play up and press and are physical is because the pass rush always gets home. But the pass rush is not getting home, and then you're leaving you know two rookies on the outside. Both players, like I said, I, I love Deontay Banks coming out. I'll be honest, I didn't know about Trey Hawkins, but I remember going to Giants camp, and he was kind of the buzz of camp, and everyone was talking about him. They probably could become good players. But right now, on double moves, you know, stop and goes, and like they're getting burnt. I mean, they're getting killed, and it's – it's part of the the growth and adjustment period to the NFL, but but that's the issue. Is these defenses are predicated on we're going to spend a ton of money and a ton of draft picks on the front seven. We're, we want good players at corner, but we're going to skimp there. Look at you know San Francisco and again all these Philadelphia, etc. Like they're going to focus on the trenches so that they can be okay at corner and okay is good enough. And, and right now, yeah, the long answer short, uh, no, I don't think they have enough at, at corner this year. Another guy they traded for, and I think a lot of people were excited to see them trade for, but yet I don't know if they necessarily found a role for him, is Isaiah Simmons. Where I mean, was this just a matter of, oh, great value, we get him for, you know, I think it was a seventh round pick, and let's just see where he fits in, or, or, or is there a plan for him, a conceivable plan on this defense as it is currently constructed, or is this maybe a future move for them? I think you can find a place. I, I think in some ways he's a Julian Love replacement to a degree. He can play in the slot. He can play kind of like down in the box if you're in single high safety looks. Like, you know, as kind of a hybrid linebacker type player. He's obviously a great athlete. You know, you see a lot of pursuit tackles and running sideline to sideline. He does kind of get lost in coverage still. Um, you know, I think IDing and stuff like that is still, I mean, it's why he got traded as a former top 10 pick. So I think there is a role, but. You know, and look, I like Xavier McKinney. Like they have some, you know, some good players back there. I think he's stacking some good performances, but it's tough to fit in as Isaiah Simmons when like everything else is kind of out of kilter as well. Like I think you drop him in to an organized and competent defense, and he kind of makes some splash plays and and uses his athleticism to do some things. But you can't have that like creative jackknife when you don't have solidified starters at a lot of key positions. All right, now this final question for you, Brad, is kind of a two part question. We're going to go based on PFF's metrics here. Where have the Giants really, really, really been bad? And you can't say offensive line because we know that that's obvious. But give me a couple of stats that you just are surprisingly bad. And then give me some stats that you think, you know, we're not talking about enough, but have been surprisingly good. Yeah. So, you know, I did mention, you know, Adoree Jackson has been a tough sled for him so far. You know, I mean, looking beyond like individual players, like it's it, it's tough. I mean, they're they're bottom five in EPA per play on both sides of the ball. You mentioned the offensive line. Shoot, I mean, I'm I'm digging in the back of my brain trying to think of a positive. Uh, I'm not sure I could give you one, uh, frankly. But oh, uh, that's a tough question. That's a very tough question. I, I mean, I do think I'll say this. I do think once you get Wandell Robinson worked back into the fold. And you have a lineup with Darius Slayton, Wondell Robinson, an emerging Jalen Hyatt, and Darren Waller. I do think you are going to be able to create mismatches with that speed and get those guys in space where they all have to be accounted for and it's going to cause problems for a defense eventually. Like They are going to figure that out. You are going to get Andrew Thomas back at left tackle, which is a massive, massive addition. So that's my thing. I don't have a stat, but a kind of a, a future prediction that I think things are going to trend in a positive direction there. I mean, yeah, the negatives, we, you know, we I think we just spent half an hour talking about the negatives. But, you know, I, I made mean, the big one for me, um, you know, is that Daniel, it's not just Daniel Jones. So we look at like pressure to sack rate, for example, where it's we would say an offensive line is in charge of allowing pressure. A quarterback is his job is to not let all those pressures convert into sacks. And like he's not like Sam Howell, Justin Fee, like there are many players that are worse than Daniel Jones right now in pressure to sack rate. It's not all him. It's not all him. So if that does get better as well. We saw him last year in a clean pocket. He was a good quarterback, um, and he was top 10 for us in intermediate throws from a clean pocket. Like, he did a lot of good. 
it just you need everything around him to get at least average. I'm not asking for an elite offensive line, but play average, and I think good things will come. That's asking a lot because, as you mentioned, there's no such thing as a perfectly clean pocket. Quarterbacks have to learn to navigate dirty pockets as need be. And, you know, certainly for Daniel, not having Andrew Thomas in there, huge, because that affects that whole blind side. Not having Saquon Barkley in there to give often, uh, excuse me, defenses something to think about, that is huge. This Giants team, you know, after surprising everybody last year, just probably right now are where they should have been last year in the rebuild, I would think. Yeah, they got ahead of schedule. No, it's true. And again, like I don't ever want to take away from a season, but you know, that's why everyone talked about the one score regression and and the you know the, the quarterbacks they beat last year and all of those things. And then when they played a Philadelphia, when they played a you know kind of a step up in competition, it was it was a bit ugly in a lot of those games. So that's why people talk about it. It's not it's not like saying the season doesn't count and the playoff win doesn't count, but. You know, I, I, I'm not shocked by what we're seeing this year. I don't know if I thought it was going to be this bad, but um, I'm not super surprised. And the last note uh, on Saquon Barkley, as you mentioned it, he also unlocks Daniel Jones's legs because I think right now, the last two games, there's basically been a linebacker spy on Daniel Jones because they know they don't have to account for Saquon Barkley. And, you know, Matt Breida, like the solid players, but they're not Saquon Barkley. So it also limits one of the best elements of Daniel Jones's game is him escaping the pocket, scrambling, picking up those yards. There's a linebacker that's just sitting there watching Daniel Jones the whole time. Um, so, yeah, it's all tough sledding right now. Yes, it is. And hopefully it gets better for Giant fans because it, it feels like we're in deja vu or or uh, Groundhog Day, whatever you want to call it. But it's been a tough, tough decade of Giants football with a couple of exceptions. He is Brad Spielberger, a pro football focus. You can find him at pff.com. Does a bunch of different articles, contributes to their statistical breakdowns. So do check out his work over there, as well as the other PFF analysts. And I, of course, am Patricia Trainer, your host. You can find my written work over at giantscountry.com, part of the Fan Nation Network and SI.com channel. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. Make sure to keep it here. We've got more shows coming your way this week. And uh, until tomorrow, folks, we will see you then.